just be aware of what you're doing and then just plant a seed for yourself. That's a trick that I like to teach people. Plant a seed for yourself of something that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you're able to identify that seed Mm -hmm. with the following emotion. Are you ready for it? Mm -hmm. Jealousy. Jealousy is something that we do not like to admit because it's not very ladylike. It's not very proper. You admit to yourself only. Yes. There's something about that person that I'm jealous of. Yes. And that instead turns to what do they have that I have not yet achieved, that I would love to achieve, and then thank them for pointing that out to you. Not literally, just this is all happening in your mind and your heart. And this is a this is a you process. Don't be a crazy person going and telling people that they're I would would tell you, oh my God, I'm envious of your long hair. And then actually you find people will tell you, oh, these are extensions. I bought them from this. And and absolutely all the time. But you're absolutely sometimes you're right. It's it's like a talent they have in a skill that they've learned, and you just think, oh, you know, I wish I had that. Yeah. So many things. So many things. But if you take it and you actually say, oh, and you don't try to mask it. You don't say, I'm not jealous because jealous is a negative emotion and I don't want to feel any negative emotions. Only positive vibes, only positive karma. Oh my God, I'm not jealous. Take a breath. Mm-hmm. See what is enviable about what they're doing. Consider it something in you that you would like to create in your own life, in your own way. You're not going to be them. You're not going to have, have exactly what they have, but you're going to take something and make it out of your own and then just plant that seed inside of you. Mm-hmm. And it's a very cool way to take a negative or suppressed type, or you shouldn't be thinking that way and turn it into something that can be really great for your future. Hi, Katie. Welcome to Ideology Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to connect with you. As soon as I heard about your podcast, One Last Drink, I just knew I had to have you on. Um, So I've been thinking about where we can get started, but if you could first introduce yourself to my audience. Sure. Hi, I'm Katie Stoka. I'm talking to you from Miami. I moved down to Miami 20 years ago. I am from the Midwest originally. I got into real estate right in Miami during this like super exciting time in 2002, 2003. And I did real estate development for a decade. Then I got into beauty when I was at the end of real estate. The cool thing about Miami Beach real estate is that you can dress up. I was in corporate America before that. And it was very like you could only wear gray suits with this much heel and whatnot. So when I got down to Miami, I was able to dress up and have the hair and the makeup and everything. And so I was always gluing on false eyelashes. And one day I was like, enough with the glue. What is going on? Eyelashes should just be like an accessory, like a bracelet or a ring or a watch that you can take on or off. And I was in the shower, I caught my shower story. And I said, lashes should be able to just come on and off without the glue, without the mess. And so I thought of the concept of magnetic lashes. This is in 2013. I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew that I was like a dog with a bone. I I wanted these for myself. When I realized that in the patenting world, there was nothing like this, I then left my real estate career to patent and create this product and the magnetic eyelashes. Then I did beauty for the next 10 years. It was a very amazing time for lashes, just like it was amazing time for real estate back in 2002, 2003. And then I rode that lash wave. And then a few years ago, I, so this entire time of my adult life, I was really achieving my goals and I was fortunate to get married and have children and have a career and do all of these things. And I did it all while socially drinking. I call it my heavy social drinking habit that I then took out of my life a few years ago. And I thought I was just taking this one thing out of my life, 
but so much changed. Right. It was a crazy time. I The first 100 days I talk about a lot because that is a, a stage. And mm-hmm. then after that, it kind of goes for the like the first year, then the first few years. And then what I have, I've been told by my podcast guests, you alluded to it earlier, I now have a podcast called My Last Drink, mm-hmm. where I interview people that have also taken alcohol out of their lives and how their lives just go on a new trajectory. And so that is a long winded way of a little bit about me. Well, that's amazing because the first question I was going to ask you is your journey to sobriety. And um, so it sounds a little complicated, but a lot of times we are led to believe that, you know, it's social drinking. And so you think, you know, it's, it's something that you do socially. Um, before I say yes. that, I should also preface that by saying that I am somebody who never drank alcohol. Being someone who worked in broadcasting and for in, in fashion, there was almost a shame quality if people found out that you didn't drink. or Because I would, I would go to parties and I would go to the pubs and I would go to so many establishments where alcohol is served. And then when they're taking my order and I just go, yeah, I'll have a cranberry juice. I've had people literally say to me, how do you live? You know, how do you go through life without drinking? I know. Isn't that crazy that that's the norm? And we're now realizing that it's just not healthy for you. So I almost look at it as like someone that says like, what's wrong with you? You're not eating bad food. What's wrong with you? You're not doing, it's like something that's actually physically wrong with you. So you were in a unique position that it was not in your life and but you were able to see it all around you. And that's basically what I also saw. So from corporate America, through Miami Beach real estate, through just everyday social interactions, mm-hmm. it just was omnipresent. Yeah. I felt like it was always around. Yeah. And when you don't have an issue with it, when you can just, you know, pick up a glass of champagne, have one sip put it down, then do your shopping at a whatever shopping event, Mm -hmm. then it's not something that even really has an effect on you. Mm -hmm. But then there are the other people, and I include myself in this, that we are, I put myself in the heavy social drinking category. And that is why it went on for so long. Because no one told me to stop. No one said, you know what, you have a problem. Mm-hmm. I was just at dinners and at brunches and at parties. And it was like, I was just always getting topped off and I was always saying, thank you. And it was just acceptable because I was still doing that thing, which is like, oh, you have your shit together. You're yeah. still achieving your goals. Yeah. And so this is kind of this gray area mm-hmm. where it's like, well, no one's going to tell because no one's really going to tell you anything unless it ruins your life. Well, this is, yeah. And this is when it starts to say, okay. So for me, I was like, yeah, I'm achieving my goals, but Mm -hmm. particularly when you get to a certain stage, I started noticing the physiological effects. And then I started noticing the mental, you know, just the, the anxiety is a huge one that I like to talk about. Mm -hmm. And Now that I've taken it out, there are so many areas of my life that I can see Mm -hmm. where it was just starting to compromise things. Right. And it's now clear as day when you're in it, it's a little fuzzy, Mm -hmm. but that's why I wanted to start this podcast and start having conversations like this because I feel as though it is everywhere Mm -hmm. and it's either talked about as you have a problem and you must quit and you must claim that you're this and that, or you just still drink and have fun. And I'm like, but I want to be in the middle. I want to be a person that doesn't want to have alcohol in my life anymore, but I still want to have fun. I still want to go to parties. I still want to do all of these things that you're doing over here. Why can't it just be socially acceptable to go somewhere and, and have and, a mocktail, and, right? 
Yeah. Right. Or, yeah. or nothing or a water or why do we even have to pretend, you know? So for the first year or so, I would be the person that would put sparkling something, create kind of like this cut. And listen, mocktails are super fun mm-hmm. and I'm into whatever it takes, but it's interesting how the more you go on, the less you care about what people are looking at that you're drinking. Right. I think for me, what one of the things I always thought is I'm not a very conscious person anyway, because I feel like, and by, by that I mean I'm like very ADHD. I'm not very focused on, I ha- it takes so much focus to pay attention. And so I never wanted to do anything that takes away any less focus. And so I didn't understand how impairing yourself even further is going to be helpful. That's one of the things. And then the second thing, I think just being a young woman in certain spaces, you you already you already know that you are, you know, there are enough predators around. You don't feel safe anyway. And so you need your wits about you. <laughs> You absolutely do. You absolutely do. And that clarity is so great. But when you are a social drinker or a drinker at any capacity, you are almost using that to get comfortable in situations. So it is really, and speaking of conscious and unconscious, if I look back at me going into events as a young woman, as, you know, just what in whatever career that I was emerging into, I would just pick it up because it was offered and it wasn't a conscious move. It wasn't like I need to keep myself safe. Therefore I'm only going to have water. That's what young women should be thinking. I I really don't like the word should, but in an ideal world, young women would be thinking in that mentality of, you know what? I am here to network and there are predators, like you said, out there and they exist in every community Yes. And I want to keep myself safe yes. and I want to be the best version of myself. Yeah. We're not quite there yet. Where yeah. we are is it's offered. I'm picking it up and I haven't really explored why yet. Mm-hmm. And that's another reason why I'm having these conversations of just like awareness is half the battle. Right. But it's not the thing. What you say is, you know, it is ubiquitous, right? So I was thinking about it, like even in this country, at least in America, you have to be 21 to drink. But in Europe, depending if you're in France or if you're in the UK, you're really young. And so it's a, a, a huge part of you becoming a young adult is, you know, drinking. And you mark that as almost your initiation into life. And I was thinking that must make it really hard. And then the other thing that makes it super difficult is I couldn't think of a moment where alcohol wasn't involved. So if you are having a tough time, your girlfriends come around, you had a breakup, we'll bring you some, we'll bring a bottle of wine. And something to celebrate. Everybody brings a bottle of wine. And again, I grew up in a culture and a religion where you're not supposed to even buy it for people. But over the years, you know, culture has an impact. And so I grew very tolerant of it, except for not wanting it imposed on me. But when I look back, there are so many people that I also enable because because they're actually more fun to be around until they over drink. Most of your friends when they're drunk are so much more social. And so I actually... I, I hate to admit it, but I didn't mind and I quite liked it when they drink. Yeah. And I think that that is a very honest thing to say. And this is a conversation that needs to be had because in my head, I'm like, I am so much fun and I'm even more fun and more funny and more all the things when I have some drinks in my hand. Yeah. And really, it just isn't true. You can be just as fun, just as funny. We are using this. It's almost like once you take it out, you're like, oh my God, I needed an excuse to be fun and funny. Like Mm -hmm. what the hell? When you start to get the natural vibration of the actual real things that create joy in your life, Mm 
Yeah. You no longer have to have those things. But yeah. I am with you. I was like, let's go do this. Let's go do that. It's all about fun, fun, fun. Mm -hmm. And that's why I really had a problem with the word sobriety and sober right. for the yeah. first couple of years because mm -hmm. I was like, sober, the word literally means like boring, yeah. serious. Yes, and serious. I am neither boring nor really take any of this all seriously. I mean, there's thing, there's times to be serious, but in general, I want life to be fun yeah. and exciting. And sober is just not something that I'm attracted to. So when someone used the term alcohol free and then they used it as AF, I was like, that's me. Yes. AF. Fun AF. Cheek AF, fab AF, whatever kind of great AF, because that is what I am striving for. Yeah. Now, again, like as time goes on, words like sober are not so like hard hitting, but I like to talk about it through a lens of who I was as far as my thought process so that I can really help people to realize these nuances that happen in our culture, which is putting a substance with a reason that these two things are not linked. Okay. There was alcohol at this wedding. I drank alcohol and I had fun. Therefore, alcohol is fun. There was alcohol at a brunch. I had fun. Therefore, alcohol is fun. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's that weddings are fun. It's that brunches are fun. You just also happen to have alcohol. It was a common denominator, but it was not the reason that you had fun. So that. you just have to take those things and make sure that your brain understands it. And mm -hmm. it takes a while. You know, mm -hmm. there's different research coming out that it's, you know, about a year. I think the first 100 days are extremely important just for the habit building. Mm -hmm. But literally your brain changes and it's very exciting mm -hmm. because it's really all for the better. I think one of the things I noticed actually is just all these things that are crutches that are supposed to be things that, that you're encouraged to do socially. What people don't take into account is what happens when a horrible things happen. You know, what happens when something horrible happens in your life? You lose someone you love, you get divorced. And suddenly the thing that you are turning to socially now becomes an addiction that you have to overcome that can destroy and harm your professional relationships, your personal relationships. How did, how did it, those stories never get told? The stories of all the ways that alcohol harms relationships, work relationships. Two years ago, actually, I read this horrible article. It was a father who had gone to their Christmas drinks and you know flirted with somebody and then he's a married man and and you know they they both got uh, things got out of hand and by the end of the day the lady goes to the hr department and he ends up committing suicide and you see so many of these things are actually the norm with alcohol but that story doesn't get told Right. I am speaking to all different kinds of people that have given up alcohol for whatever reason during whatever period of time in their life, whether it was their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. And there are, it's never a dull moment with the stories. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so crazy is that like alcohol has such a great publicist because mm -hmm. all of like, the, somehow the great things are just being like, oh my gosh, this is so great. La, 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 la. And then it's like, but if you really look at anyone's experience mm -hmm. that perhaps drinks a little more alcohol than they would like to, mm -hmm. and if they would say, okay, let me line out all the experiences of my life and of all of the shitty ones in adulthood, yeah. how many of the shitty experience experiences involved alcohol? Right. It's the majority. There's no question. Right. Every time that something was in a low le level negative type vibe, it was always because alcohol was either directly involved at that time or perhaps the day after. And so there's just like low vibration going everywhere. 
And so I call it a gray area because it's, it really can be different for every person, just like everyone can live in different, in different ways, their habits can come out in different ways. Mm -hmm. And some people are like, Oh, I, you know, haven't drank in 10 years and now I'm going to pick something up and whatever. And then some people are like, Oh, I just want to get rid of this three drinks a day kind of habit. I want, there's just so many different ways to consume Mm -hmm. And there is just so many advantages to when you take it out. Because once you take out the problem that you know, so everyone has, so you fortunately never had the expo, never had the the feel of that you have to drink. So you've literally never drank in your life, which is really unbelievable. Yeah. But we, I have, I have my, my own ways that I medicate that I hope you'll teach me. Uh, that well, be useful. You, that may, congratulations, you're human, right? Mm-hmm. So as a human, everyone has their thing that they would like to do less of, right? And most people right now that they're listening, they're like, yep, got it. Mm-hmm. You don't have to say it out loud. You just know it. Yeah. My, I just knew. I knew that I would stop drinking sometime in my life. I just didn't put a time frame on. I was just like, mm, this is kind of getting like to be annoying. I'm just whatever. So there is, it's, I have this hierarchy. It's on my website and my social media. And it kind of is based upon like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yes. You can't need or want something on a higher level until you have the basics met. And yes. that's kind of the model that I used for my hierarchy of excellence. Because people are constantly asking me about their mission, about their legacy, about all these big things. And although that is so exciting, and I'm the first person that wants to talk about this, yeah, because this is, I also am very passionate about this. Mm-hmm. You can't talk about your mission mm-hmm. when you're hungover. Right. You can't talk about your legacy when you're in a toxic relationship that's taking up all of your mind power. Absolutely. So it's like, you know what your problem is, whether it's a person, habit, whatever it is that you need to get rid of. The hardest thing Mm -hmm. that you can think of that's the worst for your life, but you know you need to get rid of. Right there. So you remove that. Mm -hmm. And then that is the fundamental. That builds the foundation that you need for your life so that you can start building up to this pinnacle Mm -hmm. and at the pinnacle is your legacy, right? Right. So you get rid of this, then you start building great habits, right? So once you take out a bad habit, you can't just go straight into like, oh my God, oh, voila, this is amazing. Thank you. Legacy done. Life totally crushed it. It's like step, 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 right? So you take the thing out, then you start to heal. And you deal with whatever modalities that you see fit and try them all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's therapy. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's acupuncture. Sometimes it's yoga. Sometimes it's all of it. Mm -hmm. Whatever works for your personality, your budget, your lifestyle, whatever is, you know, you don't do something. If something is totally triggering to you, don't do it. Do the modality, do the healing in the way that you want to heal just because this is all about you. Yeah. It's it's not what your friend wants you to do. Mm-hmm. It's not what your partner or a parent or whatever wants you to do. It's what well, that's you the thing. Do. What will motivate the person? So, for example, if you've just started, you're in your 20s, and alcohol is pretty much still fun. You're doing it in a party. You're doing it in the clubs. And unless you've had a traumatic experience with it, you don't really have the same motivation. Like you said, you know, when you are functioning, the motivation to to someone telling you, actually, this will get worse and it will start to become, it will invade all other aspects of your life and it will take up mind power and it will become something that you're constantly not able to live without. You're not going to be able to go out to a meal with a friend without wanting to order a drink. How, how did you get to that where you could see clearly this has to go? A couple of things. People in their 20s now, research is showing that they are drinking less than, for example, the time that I was in my 20s. So just like how smoking went downhill as soon as they could prove that it was no longer healthy for you. Yes. 
the same thing is happening. Mental health awareness is also very much higher for people that are now in their 20s. So that's the good news is it's getting better. Yeah. But the bad news is there's still a ton of it around, like you said, ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. So I think that for someone in their 20s that doesn't know if they and doesn't foresee it being a problem, then it's not a problem. Yes. But I think that awareness Mm -hmm. And being able to check in with yourself mm -hmm. and knowing that this could go in the wrong direction. Right. So if you are 30 and saying, I drink more now than I did at 25, or you're 40 and you're saying, I drink more than I was 35 or as much or any sort of boundary that you wanted to place on a habit mm -hmm. that you have broken. Mm -hmm. that is your metric, right? Because any time that you've broken a boundary on yourself, that's what it has to get shut down. Because when we create boundaries and we are able to live inside of them, they flow freely. And that is the essence of a magical life. Mm -hmm. I love my boundaries because I want my boundaries. Mm -hmm. My boundaries are placed around what I want in my life. And they also help me know what I need in my life, but I feel zero constrict. I don't feel constricted at all. Mm -hmm. If I start to feel suffocated by someone, something I'm like, nope, it's out. Mm -hmm. Like I cannot feel boxed in by anything. So when I talk about boundaries, I'm not talking about boxing yourself in. I'm just using this visual so that you realize all the things need to flow through freely with these boundaries when you establish them and you keep them, that is when your self-worth continues to go up. When you establish boundaries based upon loosely held ideas that you know you might break and then you do, all of a sudden your self-worth starts to get chipped away at because you're like, oh, I told myself I wasn't going to do that again. And then I did it. Mm -hmm. And then it's like one ding against yourself. Well, that's not what we're here for. We don't need any more self, you know, all we're looking to increase our self-worth. We're mm -hmm. not looking to decrease it in any capacity. And so it that's feel, what how does it feel um, to be drunk? Like, do you, do you say, because some of my friends tell me, you know, when you have a couple of drinks, it's still fine. But then the more you're drinking, actually, it becomes a depressant. And I saw that. I didn't actually know anybody who stayed happy in the, you know, in the later hours of the morning if they'd, been, if they'd continued to drink. Do you say that's a universal experience that most people have to admit, actually, the more you drink, the more it doesn't make you happy? Yeah, no, it's, it's a proven depressant. There's a little bit of like a, everyone, the reason why everyone likes to go get a drink is because it just gives that little blip of, it's that little blip. And then it starts to go downhill. And the more you drink, the more you go downhill and it just ends in a very bad place. If you can just be like, oh, boop, and stay, that is why these really great alternatives are coming out. Mm -hmm where you can still feel that same little blip, you know, with lion's mane and all these great, beautiful. 0% alcohol. Yeah. 0% beer. There's so many new brands now, right? That are, there's some brands that are literally healthy for you. Wow. And then you can drink it and get that same little kind of fun um, little natural buzz. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have the downfall. Mm -hmm. Because the downfall is, again, where it's at. Mm -hmm. And again, this is all what is working in your life and what is not working in your life. Mm -hmm. Identify and then plan on the right execution so that you can not be overwhelmed, but just do these small little things day by day to create the world you want. I really love that. Um, I read this stat actually that what by the Institute of Alcohol at the IAS, it's um it said 25 to 50 percent of people who perpetuate domestic abuse actually are found to be drinking at the time of the violence. It's not an excuse, obviously, but you know, 
when you look at the harm, there has to be an acknowledgement of the harm it causes. So if someone is stuck in a place where, let's say, you know, they've caused a lot of harm and they know it's because they were drinking, but they would have to reconcile so much in their own psyche and forgive themselves. Would you say someone like that, they need therapy first to realize the role that alcohol has played? I think every human needs therapy. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I don't think, show me a person that doesn't need therapy. Okay. Like literally from a 15 to a 95 year old show, maybe 95. I hope I figure my shit out by 95. Mm -hmm. But basically I think that if you are walking this earth, yes. you could benefit mm -hmm. from some sort of therapy. And the statistics that you speak of are truly heart-wrenching. And I think that for people that are finding themselves literally not being able to control their own actions, that is a, like, you. that's like a, a roof is, I always say, like, your roof's coming down on you and you need to take action immediately. Absolutely immediately. That is more so what I consider a five-alarm fire and you need to go get help. Mm -hmm. The majority of people that I am working with are more so these people that actually are not in perhaps a place where they are contributing to physical danger of harming anyone in their stratosphere, but they just want the best for yeah. themselves. And they know that this thing is no longer serving them. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes it complicated, I think, is, let's say, for for example, today even, the government has said that it's going to raise taxes on alcohol. But it also puts out so many mixed messages, you know, because, again, our economy depends on alcohol. Um, so you'll see now, for example, a lot, of, a lot of the pubs are saying this is the last thing. This will tip us out of business because they were already struggling. And... That's a thing is like, how do you have that cultural change so that people go to the pub to have all the types of drinks that you're mentioning and see that as a new way? That That's it. And I am a capitalist. So I believe that you need to change with the times. You mm -hmm. see it coming. So you got to change. Every time I see like a old school fast food restaurant out of business, I'm like, you didn't change with the times. And then you think about all these emerging companies that are based around health and wellness, and they are just rocking it. So I think pubs could have a total revamp. I love the culture of a pub as far as let's go there for conversation. Let's go for darts. Let's go for, you know, pool tables, whatever. What it's, it's, it's so much fun. Like that's how uh, my university years were. Yes you could totally recreate this with the non-alcoholic situations yeah. with the new brands coming out. Little Saints is my new favorite. And to not have it be, have it be a gathering place yeah. where you can get a drink of any kind. I want to take the alcohol out of the word drink. Let's go grab a drink. I still say it. I'm like, let's go grab a drink right. because my drink is going to be something delicious and fantastic. And it's still the whole concept of meeting to catch up and have a, you know, a great conversation. And I think that pubs can do this. And I think that just like cigarettes, cigarettes had their heyday and then they got majorly taxed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, it's, oh, it, it's culture. It's what's happening. It's the, it's and they've got to and they've got to really move with the times and I would be very excited to see I would love to go into my kids and my husband and we are all a big football watching family soccer mm -hmm. so we're world cup people and we do we do all of it so my husband was born in Argentina so it was a big year big win and I would absolutely love to be able to go into these sports bars and feel mm -hmm. like I were welcome because they have a whole section on there of fun things yes. that are healthy to eat and healthy to drink. Right. You know what? You've just made me realize the potential for that. Imagine going like one of the, my favorite thing is I, I love, um, 
the American South. I love country music. I love watching. Um, I love everything about it. And so one of the things I used to think is, oh, if I go to these places by myself, I would love to go to a dive bar. But you see every time there's a brawl and there's a fight. So imagine having alcohol removed. What would a dive bar be? Just the pool, conversations, the line dancing. That just would be so Amazing. Fun. Sign me up. <laughs> oh, this is I'm cool. totally going line dancing. I'm from Nebraska, so I love to dance. Oh, you know what? A lot of that makes sense because in my head, I always think everyone from the Midwest, from from the South. It's funny. Almost everyone I've had on the podcast is pretty much from the Midwest and from the South. And <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there's something there. I'm sure I'm stereotyping, but. You know, there's just a friendliness and an totally. I love being stereotyped as a Midwesterner. Yeah. I love it because I always find that that means, in general, because I've been in Miami for 20 years. Whenever someone's like, "Oh, yeah, Midwest," I can see that mm -hmm. it's the friendliness. Oh, that's amazing. I think. Yeah, I love that. Something else. I don't well, know. I, well, if it's something else, I'm not aware of it. So. <laughs> For me, I just think that the fashion and, you know, I like even now, I think Yellowstone has brought all that fashion, you know, has made it popular. Oh, really? right? So it's, it's, it's due, it's time. <laughs> so, so what I'm finding actually in this country, we have rules, broadcast rules, Ofcom, that prohibits people from advertising, um, doing product placement. But a lot of celebrities now have, you know, tequila brands, wine, alcohol brands and so there was an article saying how for example the kardashians have circumvented ofcom rules because they're allowed to do product placement for their own brand because they're not getting paid for it and so there are younger and younger people being exposed to alcohol as a glamorous thing and if you look i think that's how they got more and more of us women to to you know, just transform every aspect of our bonding and our culture and our socializing and make alcohol a must. So how do we mentally remove the glitz, glamorous part of it, that PR? How do we unspin it? That is what I am doing right now because I cannot control what anyone else does but I can control what I do. Yeah. And so I really love having conversations. I love being out there and to show people that you can be fun and fabulous and have the glitz and have the glamour. And none of it has to involve a substance that could be possibly toxic, harming you and make you say and feel things that you don't want in your life anymore. Right. I think, yeah, you just need to be able to show that you are as good or better of a version, a better version of yourself without it. And just by being that, being living proof that actually you got to accomplish more. Can we talk about that? What are the changes since you gave up? Because you did all of it, right? Like you completely gave all of it up. It's not like you're kind of doing one in a while. Or oh, yeah, no. I completely gave up. I'm a cold turkey kind of girl, but it's also part of my personality. Like it's easier for me to completely give something up than to think about, like I call it brain damage yeah. to like literally think about, okay, I'm going to have one on Tuesday and then I'm going to have one on Saturday because it's just like saying like, I'm going to have one piece of bread and all you can think about is the bread, right? So for me, I'm just like, let's get it all out. Mm -hmm. Let's do the therapies. I got super into meditation and mindfulness. And so the biggest thing I can say that happened to me was by removing the thing that was no longer serving me, I then went through all of these next stages, which continuing to do some therapies and just to kind of understand, most likely when you have a habit, it's based upon something that you don't want to feel an emotion for some reason. So you're just like, you know what? For me, I was just like, I'd rather pick up a glass of rosé than think about yes. an, or feel an emotion. I didn't really know that that was what I was doing until I actually examined it. And again, that's living a conscious versus an unconscious life. There's nothing, 
there's no guilt or shame in living an unconscious life because you just, you are, you don't know what you're doing. And so by going into the therapy, you then become conscious of why you were doing something. You then get to heal and forgive. And then you can move on to the next level, which is the mindfulness and meditation and all of this. All of these things can obviously be done out of order, but it's just easier to get to the next stage when you have a foundation that you're building upon. So then I got super into mindfulness, meditation. I am a like literally daily meditator. Mm -hmm. I will choose. And here's one that a lot of people get surprised by because I am super into fitness, health, and wellness. I will choose if I only have an hour, mm -hmm. I will choose meditation over the gym. Wow. Wow, because I find the gym actually puts me in a meditative state. and I, It I'm absolutely does. I am a gym freak. I I've been to every gym in Miami. I love working out. I love the vibe. I love every trainer. I am like so obsessed with the culture of fitness. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just something that I love and I have in my life. But if you what I'm saying is how profound meditation is in your life. That I'm obsessed with exercise. And if I have to choose one, I will choose meditation. Meaning, most days I do both. Well, what's your routine for meditation? So, I think it's important to choose a time and that's it. Mm -hmm. Choose a time and choose a modality. And that's it. Because you need to maintain a little bit of like looseness when it comes to putting in habits, especially when you're trying to take some out and then putting back in. Okay. And that's the overall positive that comes from this is that then these wonderful things that you're doing start to compound instead of the negative things. So for example, to talk about like a negative thing, let's say I went out to dinner and I had a, some wine and I came home and I stayed, so I stayed out too late, didn't mm -hmm. get enough, sleep. woke up the next day, kind of groggy. And then I'm like, okay, I'm not going to go to the gym. Okay. I have a little bit of a headache. How am I supposed to meditate? Okay. I am feeling like I have, I need a major like salty situation. I need some like nachos or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so then it goes in this spiral. Yeah. Whereas cut to you are, you've taken it out of your life. You have really great sleeping patterns. You wake up naturally. Yeah. every day mm -hmm. at a similar time, you're then able to do your morning routine, which gets you pumped about your life, which then makes you create these great habits, like going to the gym. And then I happen to do an afternoon meditation because it's just the cycle of my day um, around three o'clock, instead of having like a snack mm -hmm. slump, you know, it's like a candy bar kind of situation. No, actually cut to doing a meditation instead. And so, and that's when it's usually, you know, three, four, five, oftentimes people are like, okay, I'm going to have my cocktail, my first cocktail at like five o'clock. If you're a teacher, maybe four or 30, like depending on how early you get out of work. And it's like, okay, instead of that, I'm going to have the meditation and I'll go into a sauna or do whatever. I mean, again, like I just keep adding all these good things on, but not at one time. This has taken years you right. do one baby step at a time. I call it 1% better every day. So whatever you want to go towards, just 1% better mm -hmm. or even neutral. Just mm -hmm. try not to take the step back. 1% is so much less overwhelming than, you know, doing all these things. For yeah. example, I recently had a friend who was drinking a drink. We were out and about and she was drinking um, and she was like, oh, this is my matcha. And I was like, oh, She's like, I gave up coffee. And I was like, oh, good for you. I'm like, I'm not ready for that yet. And she's like, what? And I'm like, I am not ready to give up my coffee. My coffee is still part of my morning routine. It's still something that I get a lot of pleasure from, but I know I will quit it in the future. Right. So that's what it, like, it kind I'm of gives you. you a little bit of perspective and power mm -hmm. and also not a rush to do everything at once because I'm like, I just want to maintain all of these excellent habits, mm -hmm. build them one upon the other, and then realize I can't move mountains in one day. Yeah. I'm going to get around to that perceived negative habit. 
you know, it's perceived negative, but then I like did research and I like drink the healthiest kind of coffee with no mold and all of this kind of stuff. Cause it's like, just be aware of what you're doing and then just plant a seed for yourself. That's a trick that I like to teach people. Plant a seed for yourself of something that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you're able to identify that seed Mm -hmm. with the following emotion. Are you ready for it? Mm -hmm. Jealousy. Jealousy is something that we do not like to admit because it's not very ladylike. It's not very proper. You admit to yourself only. Yes. There's something about that person that I'm jealous of. Yes. And that instead turns to what do they have that I have not yet achieved, that I would love to achieve, and then thank them for pointing that out to you, not literally, just this is all happening in your mind and your heart. And this is a this is a you process. Don't be a crazy person going and telling people that they're I would, yeah, I, I would tell you, oh my God, I'm envious of your long hair. And then actually you find people will tell you, oh, these are extensions. I bought them from this. And that and absolutely. This, this all the time. But you're oh, right, like, sometimes, sometimes, absolutely. Sometimes you're right. It's it's like a talent they have in a skill that they've learned, and you just think, Oh, you know, I wish I had that. Yeah. So many things. So many things. But if you take it and you actually say, oh, and you don't try to mask it. You don't say, I'm not jealous because jealous is a negative emotion and I don't want to feel any negative emotions. Only positive vibes, only positive karma. Oh my God, I'm not jealous. Take a breath. Mm-hmm. See what is enviable about what they're doing. Consider it something in you that you would like to create in your own life, in your own way. You're not going to be them. You're not going to have, have exactly what they have, but you're going to take something and make it out of your own and then just plant that seed inside of you. Mm-hmm. And it's a very cool way to take a negative or suppressed type, or you shouldn't be thinking that way and turn it into something that can be really great for your future. That's actually exciting because what you're saying is that was like a desire. And if you have that desire, then follow it through, you know, just follow it through and see, you know, if you could create that in your own life instead of seeing it as a negative. That's lovely. You've coached a lot of people in business and in life too, right? So you coach a lot of people. That's right. What do you find um, is the thing that holds most people back from changing or creating something new in their life? Self worth. And not believing on some level Mm -hmm. that you deserve your desires. And it's not, it's, it's usually buried in some way Mm -hmm. of non-action or doubt in the way that is very explainable because Mm -hmm. there are a million reasons for you not to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So Instead of trying to conquer this behemoth that has been, you know, I call it 10,000 dings. There's 10,000 dings that have happened all of your life. Instead of trying to conquer all of that, why don't we just instead put something in place? Hmm. It's a plan. And I love to, and for most people at work, some people need to do it later on in the day, but I love for it to be the first thing that you do in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so I have a comprehensive plan, which consists of a vision statement, Mm -hmm. also an annual state. So I have an annual statement for your life, not an annual statement like a PNL, an annual statement that you read to yourself that this year, this is your, it's basically an empowering statement of how you are going to live your life. Right. And then there is a vivid vision which is vivid vision. You can actually look up vivid vision. This is not my idea. This is a brilliant kind of 20 year plan where you write down in detail as much as you can about your vivid vision. 
I also do quarterly exercises like the 10 year journal, and you can find all of these in blogs on my website. So people can go to that. And then I also like to complete with, um, or rather start the morning with the brain dump of Mm -hmm. the things in your mind. So And we can go down a whole rabbit hole of a morning routine, but it's just very, very critical for you to align with your goals. Because if you don't align with your goals, particularly first thing in the morning, you then allow for other things. Because like you said, there's stimulus coming from everywhere. That's why sometimes you feel like you're like a little bit like, you know, where's the focus going to be? Because people are coming at you. Guess what? No, we're taking control of our lives. Mm -hmm. We have a plan. We are going to set aside one hour during this time for the emails, for the incoming. We're going to set out this for the X time. It's just a little bit of planning and organization, but starting first with the mental health. Mm -hmm. Journaling, Mm -hmm. I call it a brain dump Mm -hmm. because in the morning, Mm -hmm. I want you to start observing your thoughts in the morning. They are fat shit crazy. Mm -hmm. I believe it's evolutionary. Because when we go into such a deep sleep and we're unconscious, then we wake up and it's just like, oh my God, what's happening? Tim Ferriss calls it the monkey mind. So all you need to do is just start jotting down. No one's seeing this journal. Okay. No one is seeing that. This is just, it's basically like, it's like almost like you wake up and you just, you, you know, you wake up and you go to the bathroom and cause you just drink a bunch of water before bed. And then you get on with it. It's just, it's almost like that. It's just like brain dump, like just all your crazy thoughts. And then you can start fresh with your statements and your goals and then your loosely planned day-to-day schedule. I always like to leave room for magic mm-hmm. because you can... I have a person, I can, yeah, I can tend to get a little rigid, but that basically is a whirlwind way of talking about how to start to achieve that 1% by really focusing on that morning routine. And once you start getting this, these awareness factors, it just starts, instead of pinging you down one ping at a time, it starts to build you up one ping at a time. Yeah. So on your website, there's like a life coaching plan that you have people go through and is that what elements of life so like your personal relationships your finance all the elements of life you coach people on I coach people on whatever they want to work on so I am really blanketed saying business and life because usually that takes all the categories if you think of a wheel of life Yes. It's basically everything from literal finances, spirituality, me time, your career, your goals, your legacy, putting that all in that kind of wheel. That's what is it because what I like to shepherd through is creating more of a cohesive plan for your mm-hmm. life instead of having like, oh, I have this over here and then this over here and this over here. It's so exhausting. Mm-hmm. To keep all of like, how do you keep that organized? How do you keep the, uh, uh, uh got to keep it separate. Let's make it cohesive right. so that you can enjoy most aspects. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a percentage that's always shitty, right? Like there's just going to be, you just have to do that. The, you know, the housekeeping, whether it's your taxes, or whether it's your, yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. But guess what? As Eckhart Tolle says, you don't think about that for 10 hours and then do it for 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. You sit down and you do it mm-hmm. and that's it. Like don't suffer longer than you have to. Just know that it, that's out there. You get that work done. But in general, your cohesive plan should pretty much be so that when you do have those days of bad days, because we are all human and we all have them and they come in such unexpected times. Mm-hmm. I'm so annoyed by bad days because I'm like, there's no reason for this bad day. I can't put a finger on it. And it pisses me off because I am super into health and wellness. And I know that I'm grateful. And why am I having a bad day? Mm-hmm. Because you have a plan for your life, there's room for forgiveness on the bad days. Mm-hmm. 
Right. And Instead of, yeah, and that's one thing that I think a lot of people are struggling with, right? Ever, ever since, I mean, you, you say, you, you know, in Miami, you guys had a shorter lockdown than most people, whereas we had, you know, open, close, open, close <laughs> for like two years. And a lot of people, especially if they were younger, have had their routines disrupted. And it, it takes a while to get back into these habits. I really love your suggestion that you wake up in the morning and you have that first brain dump, the remnants from the week that have just kind of spiraled and are taking off your your attention. Put that in a brain dump and then start to really plan out. And so for you, what you're saying is you have like, you suggest that people have like a yearly one. When they go on your website, can they sign up for, um, are there things that they can download and do if they sign up? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you can go to katiestoka.com. It's K-A-T-Y, S as in Sam, T as in Tom, O-K-A. And you can find things on there. However, you, you know, I, I know people get different things in different ways. So there's visuals. There's mm -hmm. also blogs that you can read and incorporate into your routine. You can also message me and I will get that message and then we can talk back and forth. So there's many different ways that you can do it. I'm just here to try to give the information in a way that can be downloaded to a person in the way that they 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 like, you know, whether it's in graph form or written form or, you know, kind of texting back and forth. Right. Katie, this was so amazing. I really hope that people will get something from this if they're just sober curious and they are looking to start their sobriety or to start thinking mindfully about how they consume alcohol or if they just feel like, you know what, she did it cold turkey, I can do it cold turkey. You have a podcast where you talk to people at different levels and you create a lot of content actually on social media too, right? Just oh, encouraging yeah. people to how you did it and how other celebrities are doing it and you respond to all of that. So um, I think there's so much people can get from starting on this journey. And you can come back on next time in a few months or seeing how it goes. Absolutely. I'd love to hear what people resonated with most, maybe what people want to dig in more of, because I kind of just lay it all out there. And then it's like, what are, what are people curious on? What do people find? Where are they struggling the most? Or what did they find worked? And then they want to kind of dig deeper on. And yeah, so if they want to, the easiest thing to do is follow me on any of the social medias. I'm the Katie Stoka on Instagram. I'm Katie Stoka. All the yeah, YouTube, My Last Drink on all the podcast channels. So um, yeah, I'm always open for a conversation. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on, Katie. Awesome. Thank you. Speak Thank soon. You. Bye. Bye.